We feel that we're in the arid zone when we get up into central Queensland. There you, you leave the big trees behind. You tend to get into the rolling downs country. You get onto the edge of the, the Gibber Plains country, these, these vast areas of clay soils with small rocks in them. Then you get the jump ups appearing, these, these remnants of eroded land surfaces that used to be yeah, perhaps 25, 30 or 40 metres higher than the present land surface. That's when you really start to feel that you're getting into the, the true desert country. Stand on top of the Sydney Tower, look around at the horizon, imagine how far the horizon is. Many kilometres out to, out to sea, out towards the Blue Mountains. Imagine yourself sitting on top of a sand dune, scanning a similar view. In Sydney, standing on top of the tower, you can see evidence of, of humans almost as far as the eye can see. Ships at sea, uh, roads leading out to the Blue Mountains, the city all around you. In the desert, sitting on a sand dune, you can't see any evidence of human activity or human presence. There's something about arid Australia that, that really is incredibly magnetic and it, it brings you back. It's often said that once you get red sand under your skin, uh, the, the, perhaps the magnetite in the, uh, in the soil itself <laughs> pulls you back <laughs> irresistibly. You don't have much say about it. Well, I've often wondered whether Australia as a whole has great connection with land where we, where we find ourselves. That's the, the people who've arrived in the last 200 years. Um, we probably haven't learned anywhere near as much as we could from the original inhabitants of the country. And I think as a, as a nation now, we, we still seem to be incredibly disconnected from the land. We still put crops into the worst places. We still try to grow rice and water-intensive crops in a land that really doesn't have the water to support them. We've had 200 years and we still haven't figured out that we're in Australia, a very different, a unique part of the world that's had this 45 million year evolutionary history in isolation from everywhere else, absolutely unique. The animal and plant life that occurs in so much of Australia is, is unique to this place. It doesn't occur anywhere else. We can't really look to any other nations to conserve it for us. It's up to us, it's, it's critically up to us to look after what we have. We know already that over the last 200 years we have the world's worst extinction rate for mammals. About half the mammals that have gone extinct since the early 1800s have been in Australia. We can't afford to lose any more. Not only are these animals and plants unique, but they provide incredibly important ecosystem services for us. If we allow introduced grazers to get out of control, for example, one of the outcomes that we're likely to see is dust storms in Melbourne or Sydney. We're going to lose the topsoil, we're going to lose the future productivity. We'll lose many of the ecosystem services that are provided by these animals. The digging, the scratching in the soil that allows the, the rainfall to penetrate, the continuation of the nutrient cycles, the accumulation of organic material, the accumulation of seeds, the um, stimulation of, of green plants to grow as a consequence of these activities. If all of that is lost, we're denying future generations not only the chance to see these wonderful, unique Australian animals and plants, but we're denying future generations the chance to use the environment in a, in a productive and sustainable way. Rather than saying, we're here, we're dominant, we're, uh, we're going to impose our, our European mindset on, on this environment, I think we've really got to start understanding it, appreciating what the animals and the plants do, and the complex interactions that allow them to persist and sustain the systems that in turn sustain human activity and human existence.